Welcome to Burning Platforms, a podcast from the Australia Institute's Centre for Responsible Technology. I'm Peter Lewis. This episode, we're taking a deep dive with QUT Professor Axel Bournes into the way platforms are deploying machine learning, from Netflix and the US screenwriters to Meta and the Voice to Parliament. But first, a regular wrap of the latest tech and politics news with Digital Rights Watch Chair Lizzie O'Shea and Guardian Australian Managing Director Dan Stinton. I'm going to kick off with the um, writers slash actors strike in the US. It's come to public attention because um, Fran Deshner can do a great political speech and she had lots of practice because in The Nanny she was working for a Broadway producer, Mr Sheffield. I used to love her. Um, but behind it, there's a really interesting um, story that is being told, and I think partly because the action's being taken by creatives. So it's a contract negotiation with some of the streaming platforms, and it's really become much more than just a dispute about residuals. It's become a discussion about the role of AI and algorithms in the production and distribution of content. Behind it is a, a really fundamental change in the way that um film and TV is produced and the atomization of both the the content but also the audiences. And you know, there's been some great pieces um, looking at this. There's a terrific piece up on Wired by um, Madeline Ashby, which I came across via another great podcast um, that comes out of the Crooked Media Crew offline. Um, but I think where the discussion is going is can machines replace people in the production of culture? And then it goes broader because if they can't do it on culture, why should they be able to do it on anything else? So I'm interested in kicking this around. Lizzie, maybe first as our industrial lawyer, like what are you seeing around the way um, this, this contract negotiation is playing out that might have broader application? I think it is very interesting because we haven't seen uh, the use of new technology um, being an issue that becomes live in lots of industrial disputes, even though, in my opinion, it probably should be. Like office workers in particular, Microsoft have a bunch of productivity tools, for example, that enable intense workplace surveillance. That's not really discussed much. Um, You know, the police in Australia did negotiate around being able to have the right to disconnect of sorts, which I think is an interesting phenomenon. So to not work beyond their hours using technology. But this is a particularly interesting one because it's about using as a te- technology as a tool, essentially automating parts of, of work that is already done by people. Um, but it's it's got a pretty profound implication because people do feel, I think, generally that there's something authentic about culture that is created and developed by artists rather than by a machine. But ev- that may be true, even though in reality, they may not be able to distinguish that when they are presented with it in the wild. There was a very telling example of that when um, when somebody uh, asked an artificial intelligence regime to create a Nick Cave song and Nick Cave responded very aggressively talking about how you know, artificial intelligence doesn't feel, it doesn't um, it doesn't experience pain, it doesn't um, yearn for connection, and so it can't possibly write a good song, even though probably if you presented that to somebody without telling them, they would be reasonably fooled by, um, by an, it being a Nick Cave song. So I think there's something very interesting about this. I was at an event last night about the Wheeler Centre and we were talking about what, whether machines can or cannot be creative. And, and it's a very difficult question to answer um, because what is art in the process of making art or is it, um, is it the process of experiencing it? And, you know, machines can probably do one of them pretty well. It can fool people into thinking that a person has created this piece of art. I do think, though, situating it back into industrial terms around labour is pretty important because the majority of art in our society is created by people who are very poorly paid. And this is not a new phenomenon. This is something that's been going on for a very long time. This level of automation is the next extension of that, which gives us pause, I think, to wonder how we could better reimburse creatives if we think they're an important part of society. And and for my money, they are. And then we should be finding ways to make sure that creativity can be nourished across all sectors of society and that we can have access to that kind of um, product that that comes about when people are given the opportunity to be creative is the alternative is that it's a very narrow set of people who can afford to engage in the creative professions and then also huge amounts of automation, which I think rob us of a certain authenticity that comes with allowing people to explore their creativity. Dan, the grand narrative around this, um, I guess a counterpoint is this is an aristocracy of labour um, being paid to create. Um, I'm interested in whether you see any parallels between 
the, the the arguments being played out here and what's been happening in the in in the global media, where again creators are being atomized and their work is really being sort of pushed into focusing on particular audiences. Yeah, I mean we we have come at this from a copyright perspective, but I, I mean at the heart of it, it's the same argument, and that is that we are creating. Uh, content of a kind obviously we're creating journalism different to, to what's being talked about here but similar and the concern that we've got is that that content is then being used to train these large language models and then they can go and generate their own content off the back of the creativity which has come from real humans before that and that seems well it's it's troubling on a number of levels it's it's, it's troubling for the same reasons in that you know how do you compensate uh, publisher for that kind of training like we, we have no idea how much actually of our content is being used to train these models and predictably all of the large platforms are saying it's not much but I've heard that argument before um, but that's one part of it but then the next part of it is then these models are producing the creativity themselves or producing the content themselves and you know at the moment it's deeply unreliable you know we talked about that but it's you know you have to assume it's probably going to get better over time. Hmm. And then is that content that we want? Do, do, we, do we really want our media ecosystem populated with a whole bunch of content that is produced by machines primarily with human second? And, and that, that's not a world that I want to live in, certainly. Um, but, you know, how, how do you compensate and how do you mitigate that happening? I, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big yeah, question. One, one of the concerns in um, Madeline's piece is that you end up just with algorithms t- micro-targeting different tropes at different audiences and then just getting a couple of famous actors to deliver on the trope. And so it, it, it almost becomes self-fulfilling prophecy once you start using these texts. Um, Axel, interested in your take, can computers be creative? Well, I mean, they can draw on other people's creativity, obviously, and 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 give a pretty good impression of uh, of, of doing some some new amalgams, I guess, of uh, of different inputs but uh that's still something different from original creativity i mean it's it's i guess what we're seeing at the moment is really just a lot of content being created in the style of if you look at you know some of the image generation uh work as well you know that it's it's very easy to say well create me something in the style of salvador dali or or whoever you want to pick um because these styles are so well known but it's unlikely that they will generate any kind of new style. They're not going to invent a new cubism or whatever else it might be from scratch um, because that really generates new innovation and new creativity. So at the moment, it's more really just creating more of what's already out there in, in a particular identified style, I think. And, you know, to some extent, yes, that's that's a form of creativity perhaps, but it's a lesser form than than doing something genuinely new. It's really interesting, isn't it? It almost becomes pastiche. Um, yeah. That it, yeah. Sorry, Lizzie, you go on there. Well, yeah, I actually wrote about this in The Guardian, believe it or not, in 2018. And the article or it was an opinion piece that talks about what kind of a person does Netflix think that I am? And that when I scrolled down the recommendation lists, my heart kind of sank in shame because of the kinds of recommendations that were given to me. And I, Mark? that's because... <laughs> Strong female lead. Does it it surprise you to hear that? But uh, as I describe it in the article, it involves a lot of movies with leads with women called Jennifer and men called Ryan. It's kind of a constant recurring theme. And like, if you do think art serves a purpose in making surprise connections um, of of discovery of universal feeling across humans, it's again, I think the fragmentation of that public space, so to speak. I mean, it's not the proper label for it, but it's like in the same way that a newspaper gave you a certain perspective on what that newspaper thought. If you look at, uh, you know, a hundred Substack newsletters, you're not going to get the same perspective and the fragmentation of yet another field of public engagement I think is a loss even if you know uh, Netflix can optimize for me content that's exactly right you know that that suits my individual um, desires because in fact what they're doing is shaping those those desires 80 percent of discoveries on Netflix comes come from recommendations so this is not you finding your true self through individualized content. It's quite the opposite. You're being fed a certain kind of content that then becomes your reality. Mm. And too often, I think we think about it as being, this is what people want. That's why it's being produced by these um, studios, by these, you know, uh, platforms and the like, when I think we need to interrogate that dynamic a little more closely. So so the the counter argument is, 
what's wrong with giving you what you want? Um, that is the whole principle of targeted content and targeted advertising. The counter argument in this article, which again, I love with the idea you're creating polished pathways. So you just get on a pathway. And so you're not being given the chance to jump off. I don't know mm. what you think about that, Dan. Maybe for myself, Dan. Yeah. Well, we, again, I'll, I'll bring it back to all I know, which is which is media, and and you in saw the style this. of Dan Stinton. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll give you a, a particularly boring answer in the in the style of what I'd always say. But you know, you saw this with media, where you know what the internet enabled initially, which is where I guess kick this off, is a is a two way interaction with your audience, which you didn't have when it was purely a broadcast or publishing, you know, publishing to many model. And as a consequence of that, you know, the early stages of the internet saw publishers in particular chase audience and engagement above all else and it reduced the quality of content over time it became more based and, and basically the kind of content that was getting lots of clicks um was not the kind of the quality content which was typically there previously and this kind of just accelerates that to a certain extent there is a flip side to this though as well um which is probably less of an algorithmic uh circumstance and more just a uh the internet has connected all of us and that is that it's also resulted in an increase and in, in improvement in the quality of content because now that there are so many people producing content and you can find audiences that have specific interests, you can go and make theories which previously would have been uneconomic and find an audience somewhere which will engage with that. And, you know, I would argue we're probably going to, I think we're going to look back on the last 10 years of entertainment content in particular and go, this is as good as it has ever been. It probably won't be that next because it feels like it's getting so niche now and so tailored now that we're going to lose, it's almost going to go too far in the other direction. But I'll take the last 10 years over the previous model of having a very small number of studios and a very small number of broadcasters dictating some fairly vanilla content that was going to appeal to the masses. I think the last 10 years have been amazing. I worry about the next 10 years on where this is going for all the reasons you said, Pete. Thanks. Um, let, let's move it on. There is a federal government inquiry into AI as if that can be something that can be sort of worked out with a few submissions and a, a couple of round tables. Lizzie, do you want to lead the discussion here? What's digital rights attitude coming into this inquiry and what are some of the questions you hope are grappled with there? Yeah, so Ed Husick um, uh, has put out a call for papers on uh, regulation of AI. This is a big topic. It's obviously being considered in detail in the European Union where they are looking at specific form of forms of law. And I think it's interesting looking back at that, that that was first proposed in 2019. So people love to say that lawyers are always really slow, or regulators are really slow to respond. But 2019, I think, is a decent amount of time in the past where they're trying to contend with some of the questions around artificial intelligence that are only becoming more relevant. Um, and then, of course, there's some moves in the United States. Um, Lena Khan, who's the chair of the Federal Trade Commission, she's of the view that uh, this can artificial intelligence can be regulated through an anti-competitive lens, and she talks about this. So various jurisdictions are grappling with the topic of how do you regulate AI? And Australia is, is waltzing into this debate um, and, of course, has got its own perspective. I think there's a couple of different ways to look at it, I think it's important to break down what we mean by artificial intelligence in that there's a lot of material inputs that go into artificial intelligence, things like um, computing power, but also data sets, and then how those things are regulated. Uh, and there are lots of points of entry for talking about regulation. Um, but I think privacy reform, which is on this table of this particular government as well, is an important component of that because the data sets, I think, ought to have their provenance checked and, um, and you know, have various regulations applied to them, including the need for consent or the careful curation of that data. So we're not getting results that were unintended or assuming that there's not bias contained within it, for example. So I think that's an obvious one that probably lots of us would, in this room would agree with. Uh, but I think there are obviously other ways in which we can regulate AI, AI. And one of the risks that we talk about, at least, is there's so many now lists of principles, of, of um, ethical frameworks that are, that are that are out there in the wild talking about artificial intelligence. I think there's real utility in thinking about how we can avoid conflicts and unnecessary complexity. And to my mind, I, I'm of the view that I think we should just think about adopting the European proposal. I think it's good for a variety of different reasons. I think it's got limitations as well. But for the reason that I, I just said, I think that it's worth looking at, at taking that path. In part, they assess not the tool itself, but in fact, its applications. So they look at the risks of the various ways in which artificial intelligence might be applied. And then the regulatory approach is determined 
with an analysis of that risk. So you don't treat um, all artificial intelligence the same way. If we're talking about real-time facial recognition, that's obviously quite dangerous. Um, so maybe we have to treat that quite differently to much more mundane things like the... Um, I'm not sure, you know, various platforms or chatbots that you might engage with when you're trying to talk as a consumer to a, a seller of a product. So I think there's um, there's real utility in thinking about risk and applying then regulatory things like uh, the requirements for assessments, for um, uh, analysis of bias, for treating it almost like you would a, um, a medical device that gets approved by the by the relevant authority in a particular country. I think if it's a high risk application, there's real uh, real basis for arguing for that kind of regulatory response. And then we think about lower risk ones in different ways. So I, I kind of like that model, even though I think there's other deficiencies. And that's my view in, in terms of how we should proceed as, mm. as one small country as part of a global debate. Axel, you spent a fair bit of time over in Europe. Have you got any views on the European model uh, or approach to this regulation? Not not particularly well formed ones, to be perfectly honest with you, um, partly because this is just such a moving target as well. I mean, obviously, the AI tools themselves are, are developing very rapidly. We're finding new applications for AI almost on a daily basis, essentially. So um, I'm, I'm really happy that there is some sensible movement forward and that the EU particularly is, is taking this on. Um, I do also think, though, that that there will need to be an ongoing revision of of these approaches to really account for new new ways in which AI is being uh, deployed, and of course, new AI tools and models that are coming on stream as well. Because it is it, it's just I mean, just over the last few months, so much has happened so quickly that it's, it's very difficult to for regulators to stay up to date with it. And it's almost like it's not like you're having product launches. What you're having is beta platforms being mm. launched that then people are actually becoming part of the user testing group on, Dan. Facebook's um, updated their their um, AI tool in the last um, couple of weeks. What do we know about that? And um, given what we know about Meta, should there be a reason to be even more alert and alarmed than we are about ChatGTP? Uh, in short, yes. Um, but yeah, this is a nice segue actually to, to a topic I was going to talk about. And that is that, um, last week Meta announced that they were, um, effectively open sourcing or almost open sourcing, uh, their Llama 2 large language model, uh, including a lot of the training data and, and, um, information to help people sort of make use of that. And what that means is, is that, it, you know, you could now companies, uh, or I guess individuals can now take that, that source code and apply the artificial intelligence to a whole bunch of different applications. And whereas previously, in order to do that, you had to go and deal with some of these large um, companies directly and, and they would charge you for that like OpenAI does. So it's interesting um, from Facebook strategically because what this effectively does is it effectively makes, um, it democratizes the, the tech to some extent. It makes it easy for a whole bunch of, uh, of companies, um, you know, who, who no one's even thought of probably to be able to apply AI to their own specific industry, their own specific circumstances. And we're no doubt going to see a huge amount of innovation off the back of that, which is, which is probably going to be for the good. Um, but a lot of people are comparing this to what Google did with the Android operating system, however many years ago. You know, at that point, um, Apple had a virtually a complete stranglehold on the smartphone market. Uh, Google came along and uh, bought Android and then open sourced it. And that enabled a whole bunch of OEMs to create handsets using Google's uh, operating system. And, you know, we ended up with a whole bunch of, of new handset makers and new smartphones as a result. Now, obviously, we saw what happened with that. Google then also got a, got a huge benefit from it. They were able to collect a huge amount of consumer data out of off the back of it, which they still do. Um, they were able to promote their own products and services uh, above others. So it's potentially anti-competitive. Well, I don't think that's potentially. I think it is anti-competitive in a way. And so, you know, no doubt Facebook are doing this for a number of reasons, but for similar ends. They, they can see that if a whole bunch of companies are using their tech as the basis for their applications, then they're ultimately going to get a whole bunch of lessons from that and potentially a whole bunch of data and, and information, which is going to make the strength in their, their model. Um, and at the same time, they're undermining the business model of, you know, their competitors in Google and Microsoft and OpenAI. So, you know, I see why they're doing it. It, it makes perfect sense. Here's the downside. Here's where it sort of relates to what Lizzie was talking about. It also means that how the hell do you take Keep, keep control of this. You, you're going to have hundreds, if not thousands, I don't know how many people taking advantage of this source code and applying AI. You know, no doubt the vast majority of them will be for, for good purposes, but I'm sure there will be a few bad actors that will apply this to uh, the wrong thing, or there'll be unintended consequences as there always are with new tech. And what worries me is 
how do you regulate for that? Like, how do you stop that happening? So Lizzie, I'm going to put that back on you. Can you, can you give us a solution for that, please? You just solved the internet quickly. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, I, it's easier, I think, when, I, well, I was about to say, what I was about to say is it's easier when it's a company and you can hold them liable for things. But one of the things I would point out to contradict that comment is that, you know, Clearview AI was found to have taken data from people against their consent, without their consent, and trained a model on it. They've now raised another $30 million in their latest round of funding. We know that they've um, that their system has been used in a t- on a testing basis by police in Australia, but certainly outside of Australia, they've sold their product around the world. And so I do wonder whether, um, you know, we can assume that even companies who may be concerned about liability and the misuse of this tool and ultimately being held responsible for that will observe a case study like that and feel unconcerned by it. Um, mm. And maybe the other way through then is to talk about um, you know, in terms of procurement, can we ask uh, government entities when they procure AI tools to look at the provenance of the data, to look at the um, the ethical approach that's taken by a company? Like, it, it doesn't necessarily have... I, I think it's very challenging for regulators to be on top of the harm before it is caused, notwithstanding, I think, the companies, you know, entities using this kind of technology do owe that duty in a moral sense. Uh, but from a policymaker's perspective, I can see the challenge there. And maybe we also have to think a bit creatively about how we try and stop the use of these products. So we discourage poor behaviour in the creation of them. Um, but yeah, I think this do, is a Lizzie, really do you reckon there's a problem. Do you reckon there's a particular concern when you're grafting machine learning onto the top of existing digital platforms? Like the, the common thread has been Netflix use of AI to distort the entertainment industry and then Facebook's use of, or Meta as I meant to call them now, use of generative AI to alter everything else. Um, With the business models that underlie and the network of of big platforms, should they have special responsibilities in the way they adapt AI that's different to other, other businesses? I mean, yeah, don't don't you think? I mean, when I feel people... like it. I feel like it's almost like you need to have structure. You, you almost need, you shouldn't have the two sorts of ecosystems connecting because that's when things are going to go really wrong. Don't know what you think about this, Axel, either. To some extent, it's it, there's always a difficulty uh, about drawing the line uh, in when you're talking about real AI or just some sort of automated algorithmic system, of course, which isn't which isn't particularly intelligent. I mean, you know, it, it, we've seen this with RoboDebt. There was no intelligence involved, but it, it still caused a massive amount of damage, obviously, to a lot of people. And that's simply a, a, a malfunctioning algorithm, ultimately, that, that drove a lot of that sort of stuff. So it's it, it goes broader in that sense than AI in the narrow sense mm. uh, does. Uh, it's it's really the the effects of of particular algorithms on on what what content people encounter, what content is, is recommended to them, and uh, what opportunities they have to in, in, in engage with that content. There was a a piece actually that uh, in that just came out today in in, in Science Magazine. Uh, there's a bunch of researchers who've done uh, comparative work in collaboration with Meta, in fact, uh, looking at the effects of. Um, uh, the algor- algorithmically curated news feed that people encounter on Facebook as compared to a pure chronological, reverse chronological news feed that people saw. And there were some really distinct differences in terms of the um, the content that they encountered, the diversity of perspectives that they encountered, the amount of time that they spent on the platform, and all of these sorts of things. And that's not even AI as such. That's really just whatever the algorithm's doing in in selecting the pieces of content that it that it feeds to you. Um, now, there's a lot of different data points that go into that that selection, obviously. But I wouldn't go as far as, as calling it AI. So, with any but with any of these sorts of tools, yeah, it it has a massive effect, obviously, and particularly when you build on top of these, as you say, very large online platforms that have a lot of data and a lot of data points about you as well that they can bring into that calculation. Dan? Yeah, and I, I think I'd just add to that in, in response to your last question, Peter, about whether there should be specific regulation for the large platforms. And I think ultimately the, the answer is yes, because, I mean, if you, it, it, again, this is a competition issue. If you think about the new gatekeepers of business, it is people that have large audiences and it's these platforms that have the large audiences. The potential for them to create harm with those large audiences is more substantial than smaller audiences. But in addition to that, their potential for them to entrench their competitive advantage because of the fact that they already have control of large audiences is substantial. 
So I think that it comes right to lean into this, by the way. I think if, if this, if artificial intelligence becomes the domain of the large tech platforms only, then we've lost the battle. That's why I've kind of got mixed emotions about what Facebook is doing and that, you know, in some sense, it's really, it's probably going to have a lot of benefits in that it is going to democratise the, the tech to some extent. Unfortunately, knowing Meta's track records, I think that the, the benefits are largely going to flow back to them rather than the other way around. So, um, but yeah, I mean, so in short, yeah, I think we need specific regulation for the large tech platforms on top of specific regulation for artificial intelligence. I think both of those things need to work in concert. All right, well, let's go into our deep dive for the week. Um, I, I reached out to Axel on the back of a terrific article he had in The Guardian as well. Um, what a great publication, Dan. Who'd, who'd, <laughs> who'd leave that, that august institution? Um, it's got some great columnists, great pollsters. You know, it's, it's, a, great, it's, a, great, it's a great part of the Just not a good managing director. Writers. Just not a good yeah. managing director. That's the problem. So I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm here to help. <laughs> so, you know, um, those that know Axel's work with his team, including um, Dan Angus at QUT, they spend a lot of time getting into the granularity on the flows of information across platforms, and they have been looking at the voice to parliament um, referendum. I guess there's probably three levels of this conversation. Um, Axel, what are you doing? What are the theses you're, um, you're testing? And um, what do you think it means for the way the campaign plays out um, over the next few months, um, given... I particularly have a vested interest working inside the campaign and and really feeling like we're not running a political campaign anymore. We're running a dis, an anti-disinformation campaign at scale as a national conversation. So maybe we can land at that point, but let's start with what you've been doing with your team and how you've been doing it. Over to you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And and look, I mean, I, I, I want to say first off, I mean, it's obviously very early days still in the campaign as well. So uh, a lot of this, as you know, will will really ramp up even even more strongly as we get closer to the referendum date, whatever that might be. Um, so, uh, what we've been doing so far is really to begin the the tracking both of organic activity uh, in relation to to the voice campaign, both yes and no, on a number of the the major social media platforms, but also, and that's really what this article covered off on particularly. To start looking at the advertising uh, trends in, uh, you know, around around the voice on social media, and we we particularly in this in this particular case had a look at the the meta platforms, so Facebook and Instagram particularly. Um, we've had a long-standing collaboration with colleagues in Canada, the Social Media Lab at Toronto Metropolitan University as well, where we produce uh, we we uh, produce a, a site called Poly Dashboard, which basically. Uh, taps into the 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 meta ad library to uh track what political advertising is uh, is is being run in Australia and in other countries as well and obviously at the moment much of the political advertising is is starting to focus on the voice campaign and really what we're seeing there is just that yes of course um uh, the both the yes and no campaigns are starting to to ramp up their campaigning um, in the case of the the no campaign, that's really largely driven by Senator Price's uh, page on 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 Facebook, as well as by Advance Australia, who have sort of I guess positioned themselves as kind of the anti crikey I guess in in, in some ways um, on on the on the the right of Australian politics. So they're really the the big drivers of of advertising on 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 meta platforms and Facebook, particularly at the moment. And really, I guess what uh, what we're saying is what you've hinted at already. Um, there is a really asymmetrical kind of relationship in terms of the campaigns. The 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 no campaign can happily run a spoiler rule, basically, and just throw out more and more questions, and and uh, including, as as some people have pointed out, uh, inconsistencies and uh, and potential disinformation as well about what the voice to parliament would mean, what it what it actually is, what it proposes, and so on. Um, and all it needs to do is sow doubt, essentially. Whereas on the yes side, of course, you really have to convince people that this is the right thing to do, that this particular option, this particular approach is the right thing to do. Um, and that's harder because it really, you know, it asks people to take a leap of faith, essentially, and say, mm -hmm. yes, you know, we want to do something and this seems like a good idea to do it. And and that's that's just harder than simply running running the spoiler rule saying, well, you know, we don't really know if this is going to work. So let's, if you don't know, if you don't know for sure, then just vote no, essentially. That's, I guess, the argument that the no campaign boils down to. And uh, 
And this is kind of what the, really, I guess, what we're saying in that article too is in some ways this resembles kind of US style campaigning a lot more than what you would normally see in an Australian election. You know, US campaigning in, in, in Australia in elections doesn't normally work particularly well because uh, a lot of US campaigning is basically uh, directed at, um, uh, you know, just discouraging the other side from coming out to vote in the first place, which doesn't work, obviously, in Australia because we've got compulsory voting, but also to um, yeah, remove the enthusiasm that the other side might have for for their for their side of politics. So Republicans are going to say, well, Democrats aren't going to fix anything. And Democrats are going to say, well, your know, Republican presidential candidate, candidate is nuts. Um, so these sorts of uh, negative campaigns essentially are going to um, are, are going to work quite well in the US. But in Australia, well, we've got preferential voting, where we've got compulsory voting. Normally, it doesn't work particularly well, but we've got really multi parties, of course, uh, being on offer as well, rather than just Republicans and Democrats. But in a referendum, of course, in Australia, things are really quite different. We've got a stark, polarized choice between yes and no. And as I say, in, in this particular case, too, and the same can be said for the Republic referendum back in the day as well, um, it, it's always easier to prosecute the no campaign because that's really just the campaign for the status quo um, where all you have to do is to say well you know you might want to do something eventually in the yes direction but maybe this is not the right option for you the current offer is not the right option and if you can convince enough people of that then um, you can run a very effective destructive spoiler campaign basically that that to me this- seems to be what's going on just on the platforms, two questions. How forthcoming has Facebook been in granting you access? And secondly, is Twitter even worth analysing anymore? Yeah, that's and that's a really good question and one that really we're, we're, we're grappling with at this point. There is such a mon- an amount of flux at the moment in the social media space overall. And I think for this campaign, also for the coming US pre- presidential election and for future campaigns, that's going to be a really interesting question. And whoever solves that i think as a campaigner and 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 taps into the right platforms will have a really significant advantage in future right now yes you're right twitter is being muscified is turning into x and and whatever you know yeah all of that so um and of course most sensible users are starting to either leave or do at least some sort of quiet quitting where they're just not spending much time on the platform anymore so um, what's left is the the fake blue ticks, the people who basically pay to be to be someone and and look like they they have you know uh, have sense and are important, um, and they're you know uh, posting whatever they're posting. But I think a lot of a lot of the more ordinary users that used to be there, and the more serious professional users also who actually were often influential for others outside of Twitter as well, have kind of moved on and just not spending much time on the platform. Now, the question is where they've gone, and that's really unclear at this point. There's a bunch of different alternatives now to Twitter. There is obviously Threads that was launched by by Meta um, as kind of tied in in some ways with Instagram. That's had a very good start in some ways. You know, there's figures of like 30 million people who signed up within 24 hours that were thrown around. But that's actually also not that much. If you think of the user base of Instagram, you know, 30 million out of whatever a billion people who are on Instagram isn't actually a huge amount. And from some of the evidence that's coming out now, in fact, engagement on threads is already trending way down again. So a lot of people checked it out, created an account, had a look. So a lot of influencers talking amongst themselves and said, well, this is not for me and moved on again, basically. You know, just again, got got off the platform again. I would make yes, one Luke. observation. I think I'm mm. I'm the only well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm the only person here that's on still on Twitter and on Threads. I think I, I think last week you all said you are you on Threads yet, Lizzie, or have you are you still off it? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. Yeah, I mean I will say anecdotally, it does feel like there is more of a conversation happening on Thread than is happening on Twitter now. Mm. Um and that's I mean, it, you know, it's just such an interesting case about how to blow up a blow up a company. Yep. But anyway, yep. we'll, we'll leave that for time being. Coming back to your research, um, though, Alex, what, what, uh, sorry, Axel, what, what struck me in, in sort of hearing about your research and also some of the reporting that Josh Butler and Nick Evershed have done for us on the No campaign is that, and it sort of builds on what you were saying before, it feels like social media in particular is particularly well suited to setting up division, you know, and, and that doesn't, it makes it harder to get a yes, re, you know, change through on a, on a referendum further to what you're mm. saying, because if you think about what the no campaign, you know, we've been reporting on this, what they're able to do is they're able to set up a whole bunch of niche 
um, channels and targeting targeting specific audiences. So, you know, you can target the racists, sure, and they're hopefully a pretty small minority, but you can also target the people that are concerned about there being you know, so-called two different classes of citizens. You can also target people that are concerned about the impact on our constitution. There's a, there's a whole bunch of individual concerns that you can go after in the no campaign and social media is so well suited to targeting those individual concerns whereas building on what you said before for the yes campaign you're building on just this sort of broad we want to we want to advance reconciliation we want to make australia better um you can probably tell which way i'm voting but um uh, i'm sure i'm amongst friends but it's 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 a it's a much harder thing to counter than what it was, I think, before the advent of social media, which makes it which makes it harder to get these things through. I think is is that a fair observation? What are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, look, I think I think that's that's broadly right, and and particularly maybe also coming off the back of COVID and and sort of the the way that people have perhaps retreated into their own um, uh, kind of communities a little bit there as well. And just I mean, there, there's a huge amount of news fatigue just going on after the years that we've had. Uh, with COVID, with you know climate catastrophes and so on as well, there's there's just a lot of people who, who kind of don't really want or just another thing that they need to worry about, just another sort of big controversy that they that they need to engage with now. So I think yes, there is a there there is that sort of problem that a lot of people just don't really want to be bothered now and and have perhaps just connected more with either their local communities or their specific communities of interest or whatever else it might be. And of course, at the same time, much of the broader kind of social media debate that we might have seen on Twitter and elsewhere has kind of been overrun a bit by uh, by the, the the trolls and the bots and the the sort of influence operators. And we've seen this, I think, also. I mean, we've seen this particularly with Twitter, obviously, in the last few months as well. So um, a lot of people who otherwise might have still been more publicly active advocating, let's say, for the Yes campaign, um, I think is sort of remove themselves from that maybe are still still active in smaller social media spaces maybe in groups on whatsapp or again on these smaller platforms like threads or or blue sky or bastardon or whatever where perhaps yeah they they can be sure that they're amongst like-minded people rather than being being trolled as soon as they they uh, they say, say anything publicly so so, yeah, so one side creates echo chambers on the other side because you get bullied out of the public spaces locked into your own little you know mastodon yeah, I mean, I'm, look, I, I'm I'm very skeptical of the idea of echo chambers, to be honest, uh, in in the I know. In, in the kind of serious uh, definition of that. But essentially, what's happening is that yes, people are um, are still very much aware of what the other side's thinking, of course. So that's and that's really what the the echo chamber hypothesis gets wrong. But um, they are um, very reluctant to engage with the other side, and that's that's really the thing. So you, I mean, I, I know what what the no campaign saying, I know what the yes campaign saying, and, and most people will have some inkling of that as well. But you're you're unlikely to get into a public argument, debate, or friendly discussion even with people who are from the other side because you're just so fearful now of being trolled and attacked and whatever um, as a result of that. I want to say, like, it's interesting reading your analysis. You talk about the fact that the no campaign uses kind of contradictory messaging, almost like A-B testing for what might mm. work and what might recruit people to those their cause. But to my mind as well, it feels a bit like the Yes campaign has done something similar in, and it's been a mistake. You know, they have sort of tried to pitch this as being one of the biggest moral questions of our age, which, I mean, I probably don't necessarily disagree with, but then also can make out as though this is... Um, essentially uh, not a body that will be able to um, trump or veto majoritarian democracy and have been been actively kind of playing down um, the capacity of the voice to, to influence certain mm-hmm. kinds of policies. And, and that feels like it's been drawn out of them by the negative campaigners. And it seems to me... Yeah, you can reassure something... people that it's going to make a practical difference or it's no big deal, but you can't reassure them about both at the same That's time. That's right. Yep. And that seems to be a bit of a misstep. Like, you know, I, I understand where they're coming from, but but Linda Burning kind of saying, oh, well, they won't, their voice won't provide any advice on January 26th. And I think to myself, well, I, I mean, I, I think it should and it, it will uh, on the stated um, policy that it will have the capacity to offer a, a perspective from Aboriginal Regional Australia about that and whether it's taken into account is a secondary question but to not embrace that seems to me to be far too defensive and um, you know anyway I, I think that's an interesting perspective I'm not sure if that's what you meant by rearguard action in your analysis of it but to me that seems like 
can't necessarily apply the same approach to social media depending on what you're campaigning for, even though it's very tempting to use that kind of um, capacity to talk out of two sides of your face, which does mm. is is made possible by social media. Is is that what you're getting at, Axel? Yeah, I mean, to some extent, yes. And uh, I guess just on the rear guard action thing, I mean, really, it's it's even more simple than that. You you can't just respond to everything that the no campaign puts out and try and put it right because. Um, you know they'll they'll put something else out tomorrow and, and you you you're basically losing your own agency in in your campaign if you just keep responding simply to all of the the criticisms that the the, the no campaigns putting out that that way you're you're really just letting them control the agenda and that I think is a mistake um so in some ways what what I'd suggest is the yes campaign needs to really re discover its own agenda much more strongly and make its own positive uh, uh, you know, statement basically, rather than just responding to all of the negative statements that are coming out. Mm. That's very difficult. I mean, at the moment, they're kind of a bit driven by the pack, basically driven by by all of the kind of kind of questions that are being asked of them. Um, and you're right. I mean, having then sometimes, of course, if you're responding to all of these questions, sometimes you will also respond maybe in contradictory ways um, because the questions themselves are already contradictory as well. So it, it, in some ways, I, I'm not saying you can entirely ignore the no campaign but and its questions, but you also just need to not not play the game uh, and, and and conduct the campaign, mm -hmm. campaign on their terms, but you really have to find your own terms for doing that. And yeah, for, for me, I mean, in the article, as we're saying, one of the things that, that seems to be being lost a little bit for me is this idea that this is the right thing to do. It might not mm. solve everything, and it might it might it may or may not have a massive impact on the the the, the life of Indigenous Australians uh, on a day to day basis. But it's just it does just seem like the right thing to do, um, uh, you know, to to finally you know change something about Indigenous rights in Australia. Can I give you guys um, an offline war story as someone that is working on the campaign? So our role in the campaign is to roll out community engagement. We're using the civility tools, which we've used on burning platforms in the past, basically a one-hour town hall in a box that can be delivered either virtually or as a hybrid event. We've run about 30 of them now, and they really work. It's like you design an hour to reassure people that it will make a difference and it's okay to vote yes. Four segments read the statement from the heart, let people feel it, do a civics 101 little lecture, how's it going to work, deal with the objections, so let people raise the concerns but don't have it as a bait, have this as the messaging that responds to those objections and then the walk forward. So we've been going around the country doing these events with MPs and other organisations. We went down to Wodonga on Tuesday, Helen Haynes, the Voices from India is this great network, right? We get, um, there's a beautiful um, centre down there. I think Safi Mirabellis have probably got money for it to, while she was trying to hold the seat before Cathy McGowan took it off. It called The Cube. Sits 400. Beautiful room. We had 600 watching the stream. They were all engaged. It was a terrific event. Some cooker, a border cooker on Telegram, 48 hours before, put on Telegram, let's raid um, this event. Um, that meant that we had to put on four security guards. The Wodonga police were there. Six AFP from Melbourne came up to keep it. And so people basically had to have their, their, their invites scanned to get in the room, which obviously changes the vibe. Mm. No one turned up, but the coverage of the event beforehand, it was, um, you know, that we're, we're expecting to, like it was, it was almost like the event was set up in the local media as, um, disturbances expected and then there was this fantastic event and the story at the end was there were no disturbances oh, but shocking. it kind of drove the whole thing into this conflict thing which is not so it's using different platforms but it's sort of showing the logic of the two parallel campaigns that comes out of your analysis being played in real life so a cooker in his underpants can drain huge resources and also totally change the narrative of what was for a thousand people a really empowering um, and good event. So I don't know how we fix that yet, but um, gee, um, it just makes you realise how hard it is to get this sense of walking forward um, and consensus against, as you said, um, I think it was, Dan, just the natural inclination of platforms to micro-target and divide. And Again, I've said this before, but I'm becoming more and more convinced you can't micro-target your way to social progress. It actually stops it. And, you know, Obama was the exception that proves the rule. But the lesson there, though, Peter, I think is get people together and, and, and 
help them understand the complexities of this. And if all, if the only education that Australians are getting on this is via social media, is via you know their phones and a tiny bit of real estate, which can play on their worst fears, then I think the Yes campaign is going to lose. But if you can get oh. as many people together in real life or even you know on Zoom and understanding this and giving it proper attention, I think the Yes campaign will win in a in a landslide. But it's yeah, a big it's ask, almost, isn't it? So it's keep, almost keep like it. it's it's a contest between the algorithms of mm. media and digital platforms versus the networks that we used to call civil society and what can they do to... Um, but the problem at the moment is most of the civil society networks defer all their engagement back to mm. either getting a story into the polarised media, which always has to have an alternate side to it, or getting stuff on social media, which, you know, you pay the target, but the other side can do that as well. I, mean, I must with- say, I'm not sure it's particularly helped by having a national broadcaster that's had the last, been been under assault for the last 10 years um, and is very concerned about, you know, presenting a, a neutral front because that that doesn't assist it kind of it may it means that cooker in his underpants gets the same kind of treatment as the thousand people in the room you know it, it feels like climate change all over again like i went on news breakfast this last week and the product we we're talking about the productivity commission report because that's in, into indigenous disadvantage productivity commission didn't go so far as to say you should support the voice but recommended an aboriginal led body to discuss how we can improve the living standards of aboriginal people it's not known for its radical birkenstock wearing you know, employees. That is a very conservative organisation full of economists, you know. And so on any m- normal, logical, mainstream read, this is a reasonable proposition that has the backing of extensive evidence. And, I, I, you know, I, that is not the message that you would necessarily receive if you were consulting our national broadcaster, one of the most trusted places that people go for information, which is a huge problem because the other way to kind of counter the that count, act as a counterweight to the um to that algorithmic kind of shaping of the political sphere is to have investment in these public broadcasters, and I don't think it's it's fit for task at the moment, which is not anyone's particular fault, but it is that's the reality that we unfortunately are, are living in. I mean, well, you're the expert, is, Axel. Um, last thoughts on how we can um win this? It's all over to you, the nation. Yeah, um, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, to put a slightly more hopeful spin on this too. I mean, I and to use a term that the certain sides of politics like a lot i do wonder about the quiet australians in a sense and i don't mm. i don't just mean the quiet australians in uh, overall terms but particularly also people who now have moved on away from those really public social media platforms to somewhere else and i don't know that a they're not I, well I, I think they're a, not being reached by the mainstream campaigns at this point because they might be on platforms that where, where there isn't a great deal of advertising going on or there just isn't any advertising to begin with um but also, I think they might be in spaces on those platforms where where they they can't be so easily reached because they're much more private spaces rather than in the sort of big public debates that to some extent still, still happen on Facebook and Twitter. Um, so one of the questions for me is to what extent actually we are seeing, even in the social media debates, the public uh, a kind of a genuine representation of of uh, of public opinion, or whether that's really just as you're saying, sort of the cookers and and whatever the the other side is. Um, the the really the permanently the terminally online kind of people basically uh, having a debate. So particularly for me, younger younger people as well who we know have largely left Facebook, who never probably were on on, on Twitter much, who might have moved on to TikTok and other platforms, um, but also with an emphasis of, on other platforms, whether they are actually seeing all of this in the same way, or whether they're just sort of saying, yeah, well, obviously we need to vote for Indigenous rights. I'm really not sure about that at this point. I know your your survey work might show us a little bit more of that, but uh, yeah, it's not filling me with huge amounts of hope or confidence. Like I, I mm. totally get it. I think fewer people are on platform, but also the numbers aren't as solid as they were six months ago, and mm. there's a whole lot of reasons for that. Um, but yeah, um, we're almost at the hour. Um, thanks so much, guys. Um, anything that we need to know, Lizzie, apart from that we're going to do a no, live no, one no. up at the yeah, ALP looking, Fringe Festival in a few looking weeks. Forward to, looking forward to that. Can't wait. And Axel, anything we should be looking at from you guys at QUT, just more pearls of wisdom on the on the voice and other misuses of platforms? Oh, look, almost certainly. And uh, I, I'll just put a plug in as well for uh, Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision-Making in Society, which is also, of course, playing a big role in, in understanding 
the role of algorithms and AI in, in, in all of this. So there's a, there's a lot more coming out from there as well. Terrific. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Thanks. 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 You've been listening to Burning Platforms, a fortnightly podcast from the Australia Institute Centre for Responsible Technology. It was recorded on July 28th and produced on Gadigal Land by Jennifer Macy. Talk again soon.